All right, everybody, welcome to our April uh, Lunch and Learn um, training. I love these Lunch and Learns because so many people get to attend and it's, you know, over lunch. So feel free to kind of munch uh, as you, as you uh, attend and listen. Um, so today's topic is a Delaware State Police response to domestic violence uh, calls. And I'm super excited to have Corporal Andrea Warfel joining us. And she actually came to us from Akasa Alvita Yoder, who I'll thank who's here and thank her for making the connection. So Andrea, I'll turn it right over to you and you can take it from there. All right, good afternoon. Like you said, my name is Corporal Andrea Warfel with the Delaware State Police. I have been with DSP almost 18 years, which is kind of crazy to believe. Um, I spent 15 years on patrol in Sussex County. So I handled many, many domestics in that time. About almost three years ago, I got transferred to what's called the domestic violence coordinator position. So I like to say that now I'm on the back end of domestics. Prior to that, I was on the front end handling them day in and day out. Um, figuring out what we needed to do at that time. Now on this side of it, I look at what we're doing, why we're doing it, are we doing it right? Are we doing it wrong? Do we need to improve it type things? I sit on a lot of uh, panels and committees, um, the Child Abuse and Neglect Committee. So some of you are probably familiar with that uh, being CASA workers. If there's a child death or near death, those cases get reviewed. Once again, looking at the MDT response, what we did, what we did right, what we did wrong, strengths, weaknesses, et cetera. Um, that's just a little bit of what I do. That's a little bit, oh, and prior to DSP, I actually spent six years at the um, Division of Family Services investigating child abuse and neglect. And then I supervised an investigation unit for several years prior to DSP. So that's just a little bit about my background and how I got to where I am today. I was trying to not have to share my screen because I feel like Zoom can be so impersonal. And if I share my screen, then you're not gonna see me. I'm not gonna see you. Like if you're looking confused or dazed, like I'm boring you, then you know I need to change it up. Can't see those things, but my other laptop is still circling. So I guess I'll share my screen and I'll share a PowerPoint. And if you have any questions, we'll save those to the end and I'll leave time for questions uh, then. If I tend to talk very fast and with my hands, so if I am talking too fast, please put something in the chat so that I slow down. So let me bring this up. Why is it not? Oh, there we go. All right. So, like I said, my name is Corporal Andrea Werfel. I'm with the domestic violence uh, position now. And we're going to talk about law enforcement and domestics. We're going to talk a little bit about the short-term and long-term uh, effects or goals that we have when we uh, handle a domestic complaint. We're going to talk about making the victim safe. Um, we don't ever want a victim to die in vain. And we actually have a panel, which I sit on, that reviews um, domestic-related homicides. And we review them. We review one a quarter, so we don't get to review them all, but just looking at, once again, what we did well from law enforcement, probation and parole, court system, from, uh, were they involved with DFS as a child or YRS, all the partners that were involved, what did we do right? What did we do wrong? What did we miss in any of our investigations that we need to look at changing? So. I, I do that as well. So we also are gonna talk about holding the batter accountable and what message um, is sent when we do nothing. So domestic violence has been around as long as people. There's, I mean, forever. But one of the huge cases in this country that changed how we handle domestics as law enforcement goes is the Tracy Thurman uh, versus the city of Torrington, Connecticut in 1984. A little backstory about uh, Tracy is that she had a very volatile uh, and physical relationship with her husband, Buck, and they lived in Virginia. And he actually, or they lived in Virginia. And remember, this is in 1983. So we don't have self, like smartphones. We don't have social media with all that instant notification of where anybody is. Um, you got to look in the yellow pages for a phone. You're going to you have to call a private investigator to search for somebody, you know, things like that. So 
1983, I'm sorry, 1983, she left him. She moved from Virginia to Torrington, Connecticut with their child, um, with some friends. He tracked her down to Connecticut and he started like standing outside of her work, outside of her apartment, um, showing up various places. And she made multiple reports to the Torrington, Connecticut Police Department. And they basically did nothing. They're like, well, you're married to him. You know, that's really all we can tell you. Well, June 10th, 1983, he stabbed her 17 times and broke her neck, basically while law enforcement did nothing. Um, she was partially paralyzed. She had an extensive amount of injuries. She successfully sued the uh, Torrington Police Department, and that was the first civil rights suit for equal protection. She won $2.6 million, um, and that has been a huge turning point in how law enforcement handles domestics. Um, there's actually a Lifetime movie about it if you want to watch it. I Googled Buck Thurman probably like six months ago. Um, I was going to give a presentation and I wanted to have a little update on him. And it was interesting, sort of, sort of made me mad as well, because somebody had reached out to him and he was like, I don't know why people you know, keep wanting to talk about this. This is in the past, you know, I should be able to live, et cetera, et cetera. I'm like, dude, you almost killed your wife. Like you can't just think that life is going to go back to normal and nobody's going to remember that. But that has been huge in how we handle things. So what, what changes have we made from that? So our training, it's not just recruit training for those new recruits in the academy. Now it's updated training throughout your career. So our um, certification, um, LEA certification requires that we have domestic training. I believe it's every two years. So we get some type of domestic related training uh, every two years. So it's an update. We have mandatory or pro arrest policy for DSP. We do not have a mandatory arrest if it's a misdemeanor. So like if it's an offensive touching, we don't have to make an arrest, but if it's um, a felony, so like an assault, second, first, um, anything like that, we are going to make an arrest on that. We're going to document all of our domestic violence incidents. So we have what's called a criminal report and a non-criminal report. So if somebody has a verbal altercation where no crime has been committed, it's still documented, but in kind of a shorter form than a full crime report. So, and that um, has not always been. And even 18 years ago when I got hired, we weren't doing the domestic violence short form. So that's been added in the last probably 10 years um, because everybody who is involved in a domestic needs a trail, a paper trail. They need to be able to have all this in their possession if they're gonna go file for protection from abuse order or things like that. We're also really working towards writing a detailed investigation and an evidence-based investigation. So basically if that victim decides that, you know, six weeks down the road, they don't want to cooperate with an arrest or prosecution or anything like that, then we can still have enough evidence to go forward with that in family court or a um, superior court incident. And you think about, we prosecute homicides without a victim all the time. So we should be able to do something as, I don't want to say simple, but something that isn't as high level of a crime um, with the evidence you know, that we have. So what makes a domestic um, situation or what makes a situation domestic related? I'm not gonna go through all these codes with you. Just know that in titles 10, 11, 13, and 16, there are, is gonna tell you what is domestic related um, and various things. You're not gonna be looking at that. So that's really, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on that. So, but what you, what it's important to know as far as what makes it a domestic situation for law enforcement is it's gonna be family members through blood, through marriage, spouses, ex-spouses. So you think that divorced couple, they can still have a domestic even though they're technically not married anymore. Uh, current and former intimate co um, partners, current and former dating partners, even teens. So that's important to remember because we didn't always look at that as teens as being involved in a, or if they had a domestic situation as it being a domestic related incident. It is. And teens can actually um, file for a protection from abuse order in family court now. 
It's also same-sex relationships. It's also individuals who are victimized as a result of having a relationship with that abuse victim. So that could be a new partner, it could be a family member, you know, somebody who is assisting or supporting that victim. It can even be a stranger. I always liked um, the example of the pizza delivery guy. Now, I don't know that any pizza place itself delivers anymore, like, you know, Domino's used to, Little Caesars, but now we would have, you could use DoorDash as the example. But you have that DoorDash person or that pizza delivery person who maybe has delivered dinner to that house several times. And that ex-partner or that former partner is, you know, beginning to like follow the victim again or trying to contact them. Maybe they're in their neighborhood um, and see that person deliver that food twice. Oh my goodness, the same person delivered food to this to my ex's house twice. They must be in a relationship. And an incident occurs because of that. That's going to still be a domestic um, situation because it's, even though it's, it's the stranger of the delivery and the ex-partner, it's still going to be domestic because it's technically about the ex-partner. I don't know if that makes sense or that like sounds crazy, but you can ask a question about it at the end if, if it doesn't make sense. So all those things make it a domestic related um, incident. And then we have to determine if we're doing a a uh, non-criminal um, complaint or if we're doing a full crime report. But all of them are gonna be labeled as domestic in our um, reporting system. So what is domestic violence not? It's not just an argument or disagreement between partners. I mean, think about it. Everybody has arguments with their significant other. Just because you have an argument does not mean it's a domestic violence situation. Most people can resolve those uh, arguments through you know, conversations and maybe heated argument, but it's just contained to an argument. You work it out and you move on. It's not a problem that can be solved out uh, by talking, like I was just explaining, a minor or isolated incident. And this is key, this next one. It's not caused by alcohol or drug use on the part of either party. Yes, drugs and alcohol can exacerbate it, but it's not caused by that. Domestic violence is all about power and control. And I'm assuming that you probably have had some conversations about domestic violence and you've heard of the power and control wheel, but if not, we're going to just touch on it real briefly. So the cycle of violence starts when, you know, that calm phase or that fantasy phase. Um, we'll go to this slide, that fantasy phase. So you think about that new relationship and everything's so exciting. And oh my goodness, they love me so much. They want to spend all their time with me and I can't go anywhere by myself because you know, me and my new boyfriend, we're going to go to the gym, or we're going to go to the grocery store, and he's going to drive me to get my hair cut and my nails done. And, you know, it's so exciting. Well, in a normal, healthy relationship, that kind of ebbs out, ebbs and flows a little bit. Yeah, that might be how it is when you're first starting. But as things kind of settle into normal, you figure out your routines and, you know, you're going to go to the grocery store by yourself, or they're going to go to the gym. You know, you don't have to spend all of your time together. But in the cycle of violence or a relationship that is full of domestic issues, that continues, that, oh my goodness, constantly together. And it comes to the point of that's controlling of the other party. But as your relationship is going and, you know, every, everything must be done together and, you know, not apart and however things go, that tension starts to build. That tension building can be a new job, a loss of a job, blending of families, you know, in this new relationship, blending children, it could be um, a new baby, moving, uh, loss of a family member, all of those things can be in that tension building phase. So as things start to build and escalate, um, you know, maybe the arguments become more aggressive, uh, maybe the abuser, like, starts throwing things, um, maybe not necessarily at the victim, but in their vicinity type thing. And as that tension builds, we then get to that acute battering phase or that serious phase where it becomes um, violent. And, you know, that victim is struck or, you know, injured um, in that situation. It doesn't even have to be a serious injury, but that act of striking the victim um, begins that battering phase. And oftentimes, then we go to that honeymoon phase where that perpetrator is like, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. I didn't. You know, you made me do it because you got angry or 
I wouldn't have reacted like that if you had dinner made. Um, those are just a few examples. And they're apologizing and I'm so sorry and I love you and I'll never do it again. And here I brought you flowers and you know, just showering with them with gifts and apologies and things like that. And the victim starts thinking, okay, all right, maybe they truly are sorry. You know, I really want this relationship to work. And so, you know, forgiveness happens or, you know, just ignoring it. And you kind of go back to that fantasy phase. And then the tension starts building again. And then we get back to that battering phase and that honeymoon phase. And it becomes a cycle over and over. And in that, in those cases, that's when that power and control is established. When that, or that uh, perpetrator has that power over the victim in a variety of different ways. Um, if you have not seen the movie, Sleeping with the Enemy, yes, it's an older movie, but I, based on your pictures when you first jumped on, I would think that, you know, probably some of you <laughs> saw it. When I talk about it at the Academy, most of them give me this like deer in head like look, it's like, what are you talking about? Um, but it's like, especially the first 20 minutes is a very good example of the cycle of violence and how it plays out. It's and if you're curious, if you've never watched it, I would suggest watching it just, even if you don't want to watch the whole thing, but trust me, if you start the first 20 minutes, you're going to want to know what happens in the end. Um, but it is a great example of this um, cycle of violence. What's the name of it again? Sleeping with the Enemy with um, Julia Roberts and, oh my goodness, I can see his face, but I can't think of its name right now. It's an older movie. I don't know if it's on Netflix or not. Um, I think you can buy it on Amazon for pretty cheap. But it, like I said, it's a very good uh, example. So the power and control wheel. Once again, you probably have talked about this in some other um, trainings. So we're just gonna kind of touch on it briefly. But all of these things are establishing power and control over that victim. Emotional abuse, isolation, minimizing, denying, blaming, using the kids, male privilege, economic abuse, coercion, and threats. All of those things are ways that that perpetrator can control their victim. Uh, if you have any questions about that, I can always send uh, this, the power and control wheel to uh, Laura and she can send it to you guys if you want. So a few statistics. In Delaware, in 2021, these, we had, just over or almost 23,000 domestic related incidents reported. And on the next slide, it's gonna tell us how many aren't reported or yeah. Yes. So 20, almost 23,000 domestic related incidents. Of those, just over 11,000 were criminal in nature, meaning a crime was committed. So the other half of them were some type of verbal altercation, or maybe a PFA service or custody issue or something like that. So just over 11,000 criminal in nature. Almost 4,000 of them had violent acts, so an assault of some nature. Um, and there, that led to almost 6,000 arrests. And of those, almost 4,000 had prior police involvement. And I can tell you from 15 years on patrol, like you deal with a lot of the same people over and over um, to the point like you walk, sometimes you walk in and you're like, really? You know, um, I see Joyce is the first name. Joyce is the name of this family I'm thinking about, but it's like, really Joyce, we're, what's going on? I thought, you know, we were making some progress and you know, she goes back to whatever is going on. Also, like I said, I worked at Division of Family Services for six years prior to this. The very last family that I dealt with, um, even though I was a supervisor, so I wasn't dealing directly with them as far as like case management, but I dealt with this family over the phone in my last week at DFS. They were my very first complaint when I got out on FTO six months later. So we deal with a lot of the same people, a lot of the same recurring things uh, going on. So, but think about this. If only three out of every 10 domestics are reported. Think about how many occur. So think about that. If 20, almost 23,000 were reported, think about how many actually occurred in that calendar year. And if you think about in 2019, you know, our census was almost, you know, a million people. 
So how does this affect the children? And this is really where you guys come into play as CASA workers and looking out for the best interest of those kids. Um, you're gonna, you're taking the, the parents out of the picture and just looking at the kids and that is so important. Um, you are to be commended uh, for that more than I can say because I know that it's hard work, it's not easy. And as much as you don't want your emotions to come into play, they're gonna come into play at some point in dealing with, with those kids and what they've experienced. So we look at this, approximately three to 5 million children witness uh, domestic violence in the home. That's a very broad number, three to five, but that's what statistics are telling us right now. Um, children were present in 68% of the domestic violence calls for service to which police respond. So over half of them, almost three fourths of the domestics that we respond to have police or have kids in present. Children who grow up with domestic violence are six times more likely to commit suicide, 50 times more likely to abuse drugs and or alcohol. And children who are exposed to violence in the home are 15 times more likely to be physically and or sexually assaulted than the na uh, nation, national average. To me, those, those numbers are mind boggling and bothersome. Like you think about those kids, what they're already experiencing, and then the continued issues that they're gonna have down the line. If there's kids in the home, there's definitely an increase for the ch uh, children to be hurt if mom's hurt. I mean, whether that's because mom was injured while holding the child or the child was trying to break up, um, the, in break up the fight or protect their parent, and we're caught in the crossfire. They may become developmentally delayed. They can experience behavioral problems at school and they're at a higher risk for depression, anxiety, and guilt. When, we, when I talk about the, they may have behavioral problems at school, there's been a new program that's come out in Delaware. You guys may be familiar with this. Um, and that quickly, the name of it left me. I wanna say children first and that's not it, but, it was rolled out as a pilot program in Kent County with Smyrna School District, and it's being rolled out to all school districts um, as the school districts are getting trained on it. So basically what happens is if a child is involved in a felony or a significant domestic incident, like one night, so let's say last night there was a significant domestic and the child was present, was involved, a notice gets sent to the school. So in our lease report, you know, we enter the child's name, address, date of birth, where they go to school and check a box and it's gonna notify the school. So the school gets a notification, all it gets is that child's name. It is simply for the school to be aware that there was an incident and that this child may experience some issues during the day, whether it's behavioral problems, they didn't do their homework, they're extra tired, things like that. What it is not, it is not something for the school to go start an interview with that child, for them to call the parents, none of that. It is simply a notification that, hey, this child may have some issues today, be aware. I'm not aware that there's been any issues with you know, a school starting an investigation or anything like that. Um, hopefully that continues and hopefully it's just a another tool to help these kids through these traumatic situations. So as first responders, it is important for us that we remember that we are only one part of a multidisciplinary approach to investigation. It's also important that we remember that we're often the first contact and how we interact with that person, it's gonna set the tone for all future involvement, whether it's with the MDT members, um, DFS, uh, maybe a SANE nurse at the hospital, the judicial system, probation and parole, uh, victim advocates, all of the medical examiner, all those people work together in an MDT response to the best interest of kids in child abuse and neglect situations. So if my initial response to that family isn't good, that's gonna possibly set the tone for them not wanting to be involved or interact or work with any other agencies. It can also, lead to other issues down the road um, with law enforcement or any of those uh, agencies. So let's say I go out to a home 
and I make contact with the family. And, you know, for whatever reason, I'm having like a super bad day and I am rude and not nice and not helpful. Do you think those people are going to want to call 911 again? No, they're not. Do you think that child who witnessed that is going to want to, is going to have any respect for law enforcement? Nah, probably not. So those things are going to play into how things are going to go down the road. So it's important that as a first responder, that I remember that and I think about how I'm acting on scene. I'll tell you, there are times that, you know, you, I've started off on the wrong foot with a family and I've had to apologize and be like, listen, you know what? I'm sorry. I totally approach this wrong. Let's step back. And can we start again? And I'm not above to saying that I'm wrong because I'm not always right. And there are times that I have had to step back and say, all right, let's try again. And fortunately it has worked and we've been able to work through whatever the situation was that I was sent out for. Um, but that's going to impact how those, that family and those children are going to respond to first responders in the future. So when we go, um, it's, we're going to, there's several things that we're going to be thinking about immediately, you know, um, establishing control of the scene, taking possession of any weapons. The, my number one priority is my safety and theirs. If I can't establish that I'm safe and they're safe, we're not going to be able to, to do any other investigation at that moment. So my number one priority is taking control of that scene taking possession of any weapons that may be involved in establishing that control and that safety of all parties involved. Once we've done that, you know, as we start talking to people, we're gonna find out, so do they need medical attention? Um, if so, call an ambulance, or are they gonna try and transport themselves? I'm not, I have um, first responder, like CPR medical stuff, but I'm not a medical person. So it's not my job to say, oh, you don't need to go to the hospital or to say, you know, to not encourage them to go if they want to, because they need, if they need to be seen medically or they want to be seen, I need to make sure that that's happening. I'm going to do my best to interview all parties separately um, so that I can get everybody's statement independently. That doesn't always happen, especially in Sussex County when, you know, you may be at minimum staffing. I've worked in Troop 5 in Bridgeville, which we cover from Greenwood to Del Mar, west to the Maryland line, east to 113 in 16, and just south of 16 a little bit. I've worked at Troop 7 in Lewis, where we um, handle from the Inlet Bridge all the way to Milford, over into Long Neck, and east of 1. So if you're thinking about a map, those are some pretty big areas. And depending on what's going on, your closest person may be 10 to 15 minutes out. Um, there were many nights at Troop 5 that I was Greenwood to Del Mar, Greenwood to Del Mar, just because the way things went. So if I'm going to Del Mar, I'm a good 20, 25 minutes um, out. And that might be where you know my, my backup is coming. So if I'm by myself, I'm gonna do whatever I can to interview them independently, but it might not always happen. We're gonna record our interviews um, whenever possible. This really, I'm gonna to have to change this statement now because um, patrol has all been issued body cams now. So everything's gonna be recorded um, short of some technical difficulty. Everything's gonna be recorded um, when they go out. There are policies and procedures in place when interviewing a uh, sexual assault victim as far as how those things are being recorded and retained, et cetera. And I don't know all the details of that but there are um, policies in place for how that's done. So if they're recording the conversation, they can also have pictures of any injuries on there. And that goes, once again, it's another step towards that evidence-based prosecution. We're gonna document our investigation, whether, like I said before, it's on that non-criminal domestic or that uh, criminal domestic report. We're documenting victims, suspects, children, witnesses, all those people are going to be in, um, list or are supposed to be listed in our report. Um, children, if there are children who live in the home but weren't present, we need to get their information. Um, like I said before, we're going to want to get their school information. If they are only they only live in this home part time, you know, and they're currently at the other parent's house, we should be getting that information as well. 
I'm not saying that it always happens, but we should be getting that too. Collect any evidence if um, there is any to collect, you know, if there's any weapons, any injuries, take pictures, et cetera. We're gonna do what's called the lethality assessment and I'll go into that in a little bit. And we're gonna interview kids. And it's important to remember that we can interview them without parental consent if needed. Like we're gonna assess and identify any type of physical or emotional injury. And that parent might be like, no, 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 but it's our job to try and um, interview them and make sure that they're okay. Once again, that's not something that always happens, but we have that ability. And I'll tell you, if I'm going out to a domestic at 10 p.m. and those kids are asleep, I'm not waking them up. Um, that just would really not be the best interest of those kids at that moment. Um, I will tell you that for me on patrol, I did everything I could to separate the parties. So if there's, you know, husband and wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, having an altercation, um, I tried to separate them. So I'd be like to one party, listen, do you have anywhere to go? A you know, family member, a friend, a coworker, somebody from church. Um, no, no, no. You, can you stay at a hotel? Nope. You know, depending on the severity of the situation, I might be like, all right, listen, can I take you to the Royal Farms? You can sit there, you can drink a cup of coffee in an hour or two. If you come back, you know, that's up to the two of you to figure out how to work it out. But that way, if you separate them, you're trying to give them an opportunity to cool down. And hopefully when they come back together, have a peaceful conversation or no conversation, but just peace at that moment. Doesn't always work, but um, that's what I tried to do. And I also took into consideration, like if there's kids, um, you know, if the kids are there, I'm gonna do everything I can to keep the kids at that house where they live and in their routine. Does not mean that every trooper is gonna do that. Doesn't mean it always happens. But little caveat, I, like I said, I started at Division of Family Services. So the social worker in me comes out and I'm gonna do what I can to uh, keep those kids in their routine. All right, so like I said, we're gonna list all the kids in the report, anybody who's there, but maybe not present. We're gonna determine if they're uh, physically or emotionally injured and if there's any elements of endangering the welfare. So let's say there was an assault um, and one parent was injured and the kids witnessed it um, and maybe were yelling and screaming at the parents to stop, that would be, we could arrest at the charge of endangering the welfare for that parent. As law enforcement and first responders, we are mandatory reporters. So we have to call Division of Family Services. If we don't, we can actually be in trouble for that uh, civilly. I'm not aware that anybody uh, in law enforcement has actually been fined for not calling. I know several people have received letters saying they didn't call, but as they started investigating it, there actually was a phone call and so nobody's actually been in trouble. But we are manda uh, mandatory reporters where we must call Division of Family Services if there's um, the kids have witnessed the domestic. Now, because I was previous domestic or DFS, I tend to call anytime there was a child in the home. I don't know that DFS always liked that because I wasn't trying to give them a report. I was more like, hey, if you're involved with this family, just, you know, is there a worker that you can send this information to? Um, because it didn't necessarily need to be a report, but if they were involved with DFS, that DFS worker would should know. Um, and we have to, like, if it's an immediate um, issue with a child, like the child's injured um, or there's no caretaker to take care of that child, if both parents are being arrested for some reason, we have to call DFS immediately. Uh, if not, if it's something like, you know, they witness the parents arguing, um, we can always call them later in the shift when we have a chance. So as I've said several times, all of our domestics are documented, a verbal dispute, uh, violent crimes, nonviolent, custody um, and property disputes, we are gonna list them on a non-criminal uh, domestic report. And that way there's still that paper trail showing whatever happened. PFA, viol or PFA service goes on a non-criminal report. Now, a PFA violation and a breach of release, these technically are domestics, but for whatever reason don't get classified 
on our lease report as a domestic. And I've asked the question about that and I haven't really gotten much of an answer yet because I feel like that should be something that comes up. If I'm doing a domestic related search on somebody and they have a PFA violation, I should be able to see that immediately without um, having to do a second search. Hang on one second. My computer said it's getting low battery. Hold on. All right, sorry about that. I didn't want us to die as you know, we have a few minutes left here. So anytime, if it's a domestic related homicide, it's gonna also need to be on a domestic report. So I already said this too, we're gonna interview parties separately with, when it, if at all possible, we're gonna record the interviews. Another thing that we need to think about is being patient. Um, I'll tell you, Firsthand, it's hard sometimes, but that's when you have to think back about some of the training that we've had about trauma and how people who have been through dramatic incidents, how they process that. Um, so it's important to be patient, staying calm, not yelling, getting agitated. Once again, I'm gonna tell you, it's not that I've never yelled on scene because I have. Um, you know, both parties are trying to talk over each other and you know, screaming and kids are in there and, you know, it's just kind of chaotic. Sometimes you have to yell to get everybody's attention. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm like, you know, yelling and making their situation worse. Your both sides remain objective. Um, it's important to remember that offenders are manipulative. They're skilled. Um, you know, they have spent years honing that skill, years in that domestic situation, you know, manipulating that person. So they're going to attempt to manipulate you as well. And when they're in that crisis, they need to be heard. We need to give them that chance to vent, talk about what's going on and to think about they're not, if somebody's been in a traumatic situation of a domestic, they're not necessarily going to think in the same logical order that you or I might think in. And to be aware of that and give them that opportunity to talk about it and give them the opportunity to tell the information as it's coming to them. And, you know, it might take you a little bit to work through that. And, you know, maybe it takes a second interview sometimes for things to kind of make sense in a chronological order. Because if it's been a traumatic event, they're not gonna be able to tell you, first, this happened, second, this happened, third, this happened most likely. They're going to tell you in bits and pieces as it comes to them, as they are processing and working through. Um, and, and that gets difficult, you know, when you're going complaint to complaint to complaint and you're like, all right, I need your name, your address, your date of birth, your phone number. Okay. What happened? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Get you, we have to give them time. And it's not always easy as that first responder to do that, but we, that's something that we really need to work on and doing. And the more I've learned about trauma, and how it affects people, the more important I, the more importance I see of taking that step back and saying, all right, let's just talk about what happened and give them, be graceful in thinking about how they're processing it and working through it and telling you and how not just processing through it, but how that telling of it is, you know, traumatizing as well. It's that social worker in me coming out again. So assessing danger, that lethality assessment. The lethality assessment is something that was actually developed uh, in Maryland as a protocol of seeing how somebody is level of, let me think about how I wanna say it, how high of a risk they are for continuing violence. So if their situation doesn't change, this is a, a look at how you're, relationship may continue to escalate and you may be at a higher danger. Like I said, this was developed in Maryland and Maryland was implementing it into their uh, law or their police departments and realized that when they got to Delmar, Delmar actually is in Maryland and Delaware. So 
Maryland brought it to Delaware, presented it. Delaware eventually um, got on board and implemented it here in Delaware as well. Now it's used in many, many states. And I actually was at a conference recently and got a chance to listen to Dr. Campbell who started um, the risk assessment protocol and hearing her talk and just being amazed at her wealth of knowledge and experience in the domestic violence world. So the lethality assessment has to be done if it's intimate partners and if there's a crime of violence. So if it's siblings or a parent and a child, it's not being done. It's only done for intimate partners and if it's a crime of violence. So if there's a verbal altercation between husband and wife, we're not necessarily gonna do it unless you know there's some reason in my mind, I'm thinking I should do the lethality assessment. I can um, do it that way, but it's not gonna automatically appear in my report saying I have to do it. So we're gonna ask a series of 11 questions. If they answer yes to any of the first three, it's an automatic call to the domestic violence hotline. They answer no to those first three, but they answer yes to four of the next questions. We have to call, we have to advise them that they're in a high risk of being killed or seriously harmed or injured and call the hotline. Um, what we are supposed to do is actually put them in contact with the hotline at that moment. So this is something that takes place. Like we've made contact with all parties. We've established arrest, no arrest, safety, all those things. The investigation is done. Now, you know, Joyce, you know, I've got, I've gathered all of your information. I just need to ask you a few domestic related questions just to kind of assess your risk at this uh, point in time and then go through those questions. All right, based on the answers to these 11 questions, I really am concerned that you're at a high risk for continued um, danger, that your situation is gonna continue to escalate if there's no changes. Um, I'd really like to put you in contact with our hotline. I'm gonna call them now. You know, and I would always just get out my phone, put it on my, on my notebook, call, put it on speaker. You know, my name is Corporal Werfel with uh, Delaware State Police Troop 7. I'm here with a victim who's answered yes to the questions or has screened in. And they say to the victim, Are, would you like to speak with me? And that victim says, yes. They'll carry on the conversation, get some additional information. If that victim says no, that ends the conversation because of the victim's bill of rights. I cannot just give the hotline their information. I can't say, oh, Joyce um, screened in. She answered yes to these questions. Here's her phone number, call her later. It's not, that would be a violation. What I can do when that victim says no and we hang up the phone, I can write down that phone number and say, when you're ready, give them a call. And they can call and ask questions. That hotline worker is gonna ask them a series of questions. They're gonna establish if there's a safety plan needed, do they need shelter? What, what is the immediate need for that person's safety? If there's no immediate need, then they can establish a time to speak at a later date for any um, resources that that person might need that they may be able to, to give. All right, I'm not gonna talk about strangulation. Um, so like I said, we are gonna interview all parties. We are gonna make sure that the kids are safe and we are gonna call Division of Family Services. We are mandatory reporters. Um, this is kind of how we're gonna handle things in a nutshell. Um, it's important to remember that the most critical time for that abuse victim is when they leave. That partner is gonna step up their game. You know, they are finding out that their, their victim is leaving. They're gonna, you know, double down on their efforts, whether it's, you know, the argument, whether it's the stalking, the constant text messages, phone calls, et cetera. So it's a, it's a very volatile time for that victim and her children or his children when they leave. Um, it's also important to remember that a victim is gonna leave it's gonna take them approximately seven times to actually leave. So you think, oh, yes, they've left, they're in the shelter, they're safe, they're working towards, you know, moving on and they go back. Oh boy. There are many reasons that a victim chooses to stay. And while it may be hard to understand that, hard to process it, we have to realize that it is, they have to make that decision. And even though you know, you've dealt with them four times and you're like, all right, please, please stay away from this person. 
there's going to be a variety of reasons that they go back. Well, the, the kids need their dad. I don't, I'm not working. And, you know, if we are there, we at least have food on the table. We have a roof over our heads. I know the kids can get on the school bus. I mean, there's a variety of things. So it's hard sometimes to have that, to, to remember to be patient, but it's there. It's their experience. It's their time. They're going to figure it out. And they also, you know, they may have left once and came back and realized how much they upped their effort to keep them. And it's easier to, to just deal with that. They know what they're dealing with versus, you know, starting out on their own and things like that. Um, so it's, it's important to give them, just continue to give the information. I told somebody recently, I said, it doesn't matter if you've been that to that house three times in the last month that fourth time, you're still gonna ask the lethality questions. You're still gonna call that hotline. And if they refuse, you're still gonna give them that number because you don't know when that time is gonna be the time that they leave. So you're gonna to continue to do that. We can give them all the resources and we're gonna to continue to give them the resources so that they can make a decision in the best interest of them and their kids. So it takes all of us. It takes all of us to get this job done. It takes all of us to think about these kids and what's in their best interest. And obviously each of you has a reason for why you're doing the work that you do. And like I said at the beginning, I commend you all for that um, because you play a vital part in what is happening to these kids. And we were actually talking about a case at work this morning um, where the kids were removed from the home, the parents are incarcerated, and they actually um, TPR'd the, the one parent was already deceased and they TPR'd the other parent and, you know, the kids are going to be adopted. And I want to say, wh who's the CASA? Like, what are, what are they doing for this, this family? Because I know that there's a CASA involved and I know that part of the reason those kids are doing as well as they are is because of the advocates that they have in their life. Um, does it have to be physical or can it be, yes, abuse can be verbal, mental, sexual, physical. Uh, we can, yes, we can interview children. Um, are there long-term, yes, and I can't remember what it is right now and I cannot look it up because my other computer is still circling. But yes, there are um, male victims as well as women. Women are, predominantly um, a higher percentage than men. Are there any other questions? Looks like, <clears throat> excuse me, looks like we have one more about um, statistics about across racial lines. Yes, domestics do not stop with race, cultural, um, um, financial status, nothing. There are, if you think about, um, oh my goodness, all I can think is the white Bronco driving down the road, uh, that situation. There was a comedian on Saturday Night Live. He had his own set of issues, but his wife ended up shooting him in a domestic related situation. Um, so yeah, it knows no boundaries. It can happen in religious families as much as it can happen in a non-religious family. Bill Hartman, yes, thank you. <laughs> Every time I pull up the slide that has a picture of him, I always have to go and Google because I can never remember his name. Yes, um, children are a much higher percentage to be um, abusers if they have grown up in an abusive situation. Um, we do not have like specific guidelines. Like you mean if, like if we're sent to a complaint, we're gonna do our best to investigate it. We may have people who don't want to speak and that happens all the time or somebody else calls and they're like, I didn't call you. I'm not talking to you. All right, well, you know what? We got this call. We at least need to make sure that everybody's okay. 
And, you know, sometimes that'll get you a foot in the door and then somebody will start talking. Other times you see the people in the home, everybody's okay, and you're, you're going to leave. Um, the Lifetime movie was, can you go? so we can, we always have victim services. So anytime we respond to a domestic related complaint, uh, it gets sent to victim services for follow-up. And there are victim services in, um, in Sussex County. There's one at Troop 5 in Bridgeville, Troop 4 in Georgetown, and Troop 7 in Lewis. And as well as like Georgetown PD has their own victim services. In Kent County, there's one at Troop 3. And then Smyrna has one. And I think that's, oh, Dover PD has one. So in, we then cover, in each county, we cover the municipalities as well. So if there's a domestic, it gets sent to the victim services, they follow up and you know can offer additional services. Like I said, even if somebody doesn't wanna to talk to the hotline when I'm there, I always made sure I gave them the hotline number so that they could call at a later time. Uh, the Lifetime movie was Tracy Thurman. Uh, Tracy Thurman uh, was the victim of abuse by her husband, Buck, in Torrington, Connecticut. And the other movie was Sleeping with the Enemy with Julia Roberts. Take Care, Delaware, yes. That's it, thank you. I was like, why am I drawing a blank on what the program that refers to the school? So if I check the box saying that a child was present, it's gonna go through Take Care Delaware. And I believe that the email in the subject line says Take Care Delaware. That, is there a therapy for children? And if so, do they have to pay? I don't know the answer to that. I know that the Children's Advocacy Center has a therapist on staff. I know that they can recommend therapy. I don't know the specifics of the payment plan for that. Is there anything domestic of, or unique about Native American domestic issues? I cannot actually answer that question specifically. Um, a lot of times, I can tell you that a lot of times in Native American communities, they have their own, um, I don't wanna say police, but they have their own like system that's gonna handle that versus calling the police but I don't know how that um, actually affects it. And I watched a presentation on that, which is on the Native Americans and, and domestics. And that was one thing that I had picked up. We don't have, as far as the Native American population in Delaware, I don't know if there's any statistics showing whether they call or not. Um, what are like the time frames in all of this? Because it seems like it's just a long period of time before any of the resolutions or things like that. And so you have this, you know, uh, repeat, repeat like a cycle going on. Well, because we can do all the investigation, we can have all the resources in, in involved, but if that person chooses, it's, it's their decision. And you know, until they make that decision to make a change, we can't force them. And yeah, sometimes it is a very, very long drawn out process. Um, you know, depending on the kids, jobs, you know, things like that. It, it's, unfortunately it's not a quick fix. And one thing that, to think about like for law enforcement, so I can make an arrest. And that arrest, that person might not go to jail, but that hour and a half or two hours that I have them at the troop, you know, writing their warrant, processing them in front of the judge till they are released, gives that victim a few hours to come up with some type of safety. And, you know, whether they're going to stay at their home or they're going to go stay somewhere else, that initial safety, and hopefully they can, you know, continue with that safety plan. It's not unusual that you can you make an arrest and then you know several weeks months down the road till it gets to um a trial they've changed their mind you know they have been without that person you know like i said before the parent or the kids don't have their other parent or they're not sure where they're staying because they can't afford to stay at the home um so it's better it's easier for them to just stay in that relationship because they know that there's a roof over their head there's food there's clothes etc um, statistics. 
Oh, in no. reference to like um, teen dating and stuff, have you seen the really the um, increase in violence with abuse, with relationships with teens? Um, there has been some increase. I cannot give you any statistics. I know that they are, you know, working on some presentations for the school districts for um, teen dating violence. Um, where can victims go and they can bring their pets? There are very few shelters that are going to take a pet. So that does create an issue in, you know, somebody leaving that situation. Um, I don't know. I know that sometimes they can get like a foster situation. Um, I don't know the details of how that works, but I don't believe that they can take them to a shelter. And if a shelter is full, they will um, try and get somebody a hotel. But if the shelter is not full, I'm not sure that they're gonna send them to a hotel simply for their pets. But I don't know 100% certain on that. And there are three bills uh, right now. One is dealing with pets and domestic violence. So um, the one that's up now, or one of the ones that's up is in a PFA, they can include pets in that. Um, there's another bill uh, that's gonna be sent like you said here for DFS and others to report animal cruelty. Um, it's, there is a huge link between animal cruelty and domestics. Um, let's see. What does the, PFA child's, stand for what, again? What does the PFA stand for again, person and? Protection from abuse order. So with a protection from abuse order, anybody can file for that, um, like an intimate partner or if, boyfriend, girlfriend, even a teen dating. DFS can file for it on behalf of a child. Um, I believe that adult services can file for a PFA on behalf of an infirmed adult. So if there's violence in a relationship and they're fearful, they can go to family court and, and apply for that. There is an emergency and non-emergency PFA. So if they go and apply for an emergency PFA, they're gonna know generally that day if it's granted. Um, and then there will be a hearing within 10 days where they have to show the calls for that PFA to stay in place. Um, if, you know, cause there are people who go and apply for a PFA who really probably shouldn't have it granted. And that's gonna come out at that 10 day hearing. But a lot of times, okay. do they know about like the PFA or is it something that you, that the officer um, makes them aware of or gives them, educate, educates them? I mean, how do they, most of the no to do to follow PFA. There, the PFA is listed on Family Court website. It's listed on most domestic related things like People's Place. You're going to probably get some information about it. The Domestic Violence Coordinating Council, Family Court. Most troopers are going to give them some type of information about a PFA. Most probably aren't going to know all the details, but can tell them to go to Family Court and petition for protection from abuse order. And the hotline, like if they talk to the domestic violence hotline, they can tell them that as well. If a child is violent towards a parent, is that domestic? Yes, that would still be a domestic violence or a domestic report. And yes, they're one of those bills is is um, addressing how family court deals with family pets. Like like I said, if if there's a PFA or there's a child custody issue, the pets can be included in that. Awesome. Andrea, I'm going to wrap it up now just because we've hit our limit. I don't want to ever take anybody more than anybody's time. Um, but thank you so much for taking the time to do this. This is super, super helpful. And I, I, I know a lot of CASAs have asked for this particular training. Um, so I hope it, I, I think it answered all the, you know, most of the questions that people had because so many times domestic violence is part of our our, our cases and just it's such a complicated topic um, that it was super helpful just hearing your information and it's awesome that you have both the DFS and the DSP uh, experience. Thank you. Thank All you. All right, everybody. Great. Thank you. Thank